Welcome, welcome. That's a lovely view. David, I don't know where you are, but it's lovely. Welcome, if you're just joining. We'll be underway in a couple of minutes. Pam's just letting more people in. Uh, if you'd like to, in the chat, just tell me where in the world you're dialing in from right now. I'm in Brighton in the UK, south coast, about an hour south of London. Toronto, Canada. Hey, check out this, Toronto, Canada. Go Blue Jays. I'm a, I'm a big uh, baseball fan and Toronto Blue Jays fan. Los Angeles, go Jays, go, yes. There, there's a thing I did not expect to be saying, just so, so I've dropped the baseball now. Uh, Copenhagen, Argentina, Los Angeles. This is, uh, yeah, truly global. Beirut, Hamburg, Germany. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We'll just give everyone a minute just to settle in and land. We're going to be here for an hour. Paris, bonjour. San Diego, yeah. Good. You guys are covering the world really well tonight. That's good. Tonight, my time, whatever time it is of day for you. Switzerland. So what I'm seeing right now is um, the waiting room keeps filling up and then emptying. So we'll just give everyone that minute to get settled in. So just uh, while everyone else is arriving, so what's on the screen there is my uh, contact details and stuff if you want to <clears throat> uh, check out anything by way of follow-up. I'll, I'll do a proper intro um, when we start in a moment. Still more people coming in the waiting room, joining. We'll just give them another minute. And then they're officially late if anyone joins after that. So um, then we will just start and then just make them feel welcome when they arrive. So we've got 28 of you here. If you've just joined, we're just sharing in the chat where you're dialing in from in the world. We've had everyone from Toronto, Canada, to Hamburg, to Beirut, to Los Angeles, Argentina, Copenhagen, San Diego, Switzerland, Mexico, New York City. I miss New York. I miss um, Smalls Jazz Club in New York is my favorite jazz club in the world. Just want to get back to Smalls. I just want to go and spend a Sunday afternoon in Smalls. On, on Sundays, you can sit in Smalls Jazz Club all day um, for about $20. And just, just all these amazing musicians just come through throughout the day. Right. It's um, in my time, UK, it's uh, 7.02. And um, there's still some people streaming in. So we're just going to get started and we'll just make them feel welcome. Um, so, firstly, just welcome everybody. Um, really excited to be with you this evening and to be doing this. Um, when Pam in, in invited me, it just felt like one of those uh, opportunities that I couldn't turn down. So, lovely to be with you this evening. Um, my name is Graham Alcott. I'm the founder of a company called Think Productive. We do productivity training and coaching with organizations around the world, uh, with offices in the UK, US, Netherlands for Western Europe, and then Australia for Australia and New Zealand. Um, you can find a lot more information about me at that uh, web address that's on the slide there. So grahamalcott.com forward slash links. We'll share that again at the end. And social media wise, I'm just at Graham Alcott on all the, all the things. Uh, I'm probably best known for my book, How to Be a Productivity Ninja, uh, which is a bestseller here in the UK and in a few other countries. Um, and I also run a podcast called Beyond Busy, um, which we do at getbeyondbusy.com. And also you can uh, check that out on YouTube. I just had uh, Seth Godin on my podcast last week. It was really exciting. And um, that's up on YouTube if you want to check that out. Just if you go to YouTube and put in Beyond Busy, Seth Godin, you'll find it there. Cool. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about productivity and the interesting thing about productivity is it's also a whole bunch of questions around work-life balance, um, around running your business, um, around boundaries, and a lot of other stuff which I think is very transferable to other parts of um, work and life as well. Um, but I'm going to start by exploding a bit of a myth. So often when people think of productivity, they think of time management. 
and there's a lot of uh you know workshops and books and various things that have been written on the subject of time management which i think a lot of people are quite tired of as a subject matter and you know when, when i'm in rooms with people i'll often say put your hand up if you've been on some kind of time management program before and then keep your hand up if everything is now fixed and it's all sorted and of course everyone puts their hand down um, i think a lot of the literature around time management was written in an age where information overload didn't exist and a lot of those good principles um, don't really apply when we just have such easy access to information all day and how we manage our attention is much more important than how we manage our time so uh, the first myth i'm going to sort of explode tonight is don't try and manage your time try and manage your attention and i'll talk a bit more about the hierarchies of attention and the things that we really need to put more emphasis on and less emphasis on um, as we go through because not all not all hours of our day are completely equal so it's much more about more about managing our attention rather than managing our time and in how to be a productivity ninja i have this uh this uh, first chapter the nine characteristics of the productivity ninja so what i'm going to do for our time together this evening is spend the first kind of 40 minutes or so i'm just going to talk you through the nine characteristics of the productivity ninja this is really nine ways to think about how we manage our attention how we manage boundaries how we say no uh, how we manage our energy and so on and then for the last 20 minutes i'm going to give you some time the last 20 minutes or so uh, where you're just going to be either asking questions or uh, you know reflecting on your own experiences um, and we'll use the chat um, as we go as well so by the way the chat is open on this zoom meeting we're not in webinar mode but um, i have the chat box open right here so as we go through if there's anything you want me to explain or you want to uh, just get a bit more information on then i can't promise to respond to all of them as we go through but just put it in the chat and i'll, and I'll try and get to it and if not i'll come back to those uh, when we get to the q a at the end uh, i'm gonna give you a couple of little times through the session as well, just uh, just to on your own, just reflect for a minute or so. So if you've got a pen and paper handy, um, that will help. Because the thing with all this stuff, right, is that you can um, spend a lot of time chasing the next knowledge um, and spend a lot of time on YouTube looking at stuff that's inspirational or whatever. But really what matters is doing stuff, right? So what I'd love you to take away from tonight is not just I absorb some stuff for an hour, but like these are three things I'm now committed to. Um, so that's really my aim uh, for this session is to give you something that you can take away and actually do. Okay, so our first of nine characteristics is Zen-like calm. So when I ask people, when are you most productive? One of the very common answers I get to that question is when I'm on a deadline. And it's not actually the deadline that makes you productive. It's the fact that a deadline induces this state of Zen-like calm, what psychologists refer to as flow. And that means being present and in the moment and focused on one thing. We've all had those moments at work where it feels like regular time just seems to kind of fade away and we're not thinking about what we're going to have for dinner or our emails or anything else. We're totally focused and present and in the moment and just working on that one thing. And it just kind of feels almost like magical. Um, deadlines are really good for getting us there, but deadlines are a really expensive way to get us there as well. Um, deadlines induce a lot of stress. And we want to be able to get into this, this state of Zen-like calm and flow um, without the need for deadlines. Not Zen-like calm and flow, right? So this is um, how many people spend a good proportion of their days. Um, maybe some of you can relate to uh, today feeling like a, a little bit like this already. Um, so one of the quickest ways to achieve Zen-like calm is simply to get everything out of your head it's really hard to be present and focused and in the moment when there's a hundred things in your head that you need to deal with. So getting everything out of your head just makes it all feel better. So um, if you've ever had that feeling of it's the week before Christmas or the week before you're going to go on a trip and you just feel totally overwhelmed, you get a pen and paper, you write everything down and suddenly you just feel instinctively much better and much calmer. That's then like calm, right? So the idea of getting it all out of your head um, David Allen, who wrote the book, Getting Things Done, has this lovely phrase, the mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. The mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. Why is this so stressful in modern life? Um, so if you think back to the kind of jobs that we would have done back in the industrial age, um, it looks something like this. So there's a, a, a conveyor belt in the cake factory and all the cakes are coming down the conveyor belt and you've got a big box of cherries and your job every day is just to put cherries on cakes you know speed up if the conveyor belt speeds up if 
the conveyor belt stops, you just wait. There's nothing else for you to do. So in that kind of a job, how many people would be going home on a Friday night and thinking, oh, the cherries this week. It was crazy. Um, or in that kind of a job, how many people would be sat there on a Sunday evening and thinking, I have no idea what's going to happen next week. Because the thing about the industrial age kind of jobs is it's very easy to know what does done look like? What does the end look like? Um, it's very easy to know whether you're successful or not in a job that looks like putting cherries on cakes. Um, but the problem is in the work that we do, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're working in a business, you have to put cherries on cakes. Um, so you have to deliver the meetings and the reports and create the new products and you know, send emails. All those things are those little cherries in your own job. So you have to put cherries on cakes. But it's like you're also the person uh, that at the same time as trying to put cherries on cakes, someone's whispering in your ear saying, what time should the shift start today? How fast, how fast should the conveyor belt go? How big should the cakes be? And let's think about what's going on in the wider world, which is everyone's talking about healthy eating. So let's get rid of the cakes completely and make fruit cocktails with these cherries instead. So you're having to have that strategic mindset of being the boss, as well as being uh, in that worker mindset of actually putting cherries on cake in whatever that means for your own role. Um, so really it's about saying that we're simultaneously the boss and the worker all at the same time. Zen like calm comes when we're um, treating ourselves as these two different roles. Um, often when we're stressed, it's because we're mixed up. We're half in this boss mode, this thinking mode, and we're half in the doing mode. So what we need to do is separate these two things out, find times in our week where we're very much in thinking mode, defining the work, um, looking ahead, thinking strategically, and then times in the week where we're much more in the, the delivery mode, the heads down, just get stuff done kind of mode. And what I find is the more you, you can be barriered and have um, good delineation between those two things, um, the easier both of those things actually become. Okay, I'm going to give you two other characteristics and then I'm going to ask you to write some stuff down and make some plans for yourself. Um, so this next one is ruthlessness. So what I'm not talking about here is ruthlessness in the sense of you know, Leonardo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street bowling with dwarves and like treating people badly. I don't mean ruthlessness in that kind of way at all. Um, in fact, the next book that I'm writing right now is a book about kindness in leadership. And I think kindness is a, a very underrated um, leadership trait that really brings people together. But we need to be ruthless around how we think and how we define the work. And we need to be ruthless with our own expectations. So there was a study a little while back that found that the happiest nation on earth was Denmark. So hello, Copenhagen from earlier. Um, and when they uh, were interviewing people about this study and saying, hey, like Denmark seems to have really got work-life balance um, really under control and uh, Denmark's officially the happiest country in the world. Why is that? Um, one of the people on the, the TV news when they were interviewed about it said, well, the thing is we just have lower expectations. And so I think this is a really important um, lesson for life. It's one that we need to remember over and over and over again, is you'll be less stressed when you have lower expectations. And we need to be much more ruthless with ourselves in terms of defining what we can actually do. So I'm sure you've come across before uh, the idea of the planning fallacy, which basically says that everybody, even when we know about this, we will massively overestimate the number of things that we can actually fit into a day. And what that leads to is us just feeling... Uh, a bit dejected at the end of the day that we haven't managed to get everything done. Um, so my solution for that is the humble um, post-it note or notelet, little paper notelet. So you write down your tasks for the day on something as small as this. And then because this is small, you can't fill it too full. So it kind of negates that, that planning, pl planning fallacy kind of idea. Um, but getting much more realistic around that will actually help you to be much more defined, uh, much more ruthless and say no to more stuff, which we need to do a lot more of. Um, also, we need to be ruthless with ourselves. Um, so um, I'd love to hear in the, the chat and in the Q&A your stories around procrastination. But um, su suffice to say that procrastination is not something that we should deny. Um, it happens to everybody. It happens even when you write books about productivity. I procrastinate too. Um, and there was one study that found the people who procrastinate the most are the most creative and most intelligent people. So if you're feeling a bit guilty right now, then congratulations, you're either very creative or very intelligent. So we really need to think about procrastination and be ruthless with ourselves um, in terms of how we solve that. I'll talk a little bit later about um, what I do around my phone. My phone is my main source of procrastination and I use 
um, a, a phone blocker app, which I'll tell you about um, in a few minutes, that allows me to make basically one good decision once in a really ruthless way. And then it manages my procrastination around that. So it's really about um, finding ways to treat yourself like a child in the best possible way. And we also have to be really ruthless around managing our attention. I mentioned at the beginning that this is not about how we manage time. It's about how we manage attention. And the, the particular part of our attention that we need to pay uh, the most attention to um, is the two to three hours that we have every day where we feel the most energy, we feel the most in flow. Um, we have uh, the, the, the biggest amount of, of what um, uh, is often known by psychologists as strength control. So there's a psychologist called Roy Baumeister who talks about this. And um, basically strength control is kind of like uh, willpower and decision fatigue put together. Um, but basically your ability to kind of push things forward, make big decisions, be decisive, is really at its height when you have good energy and then it wanes throughout the day. So for most people, uh, the morning tends to be the time where you'll have this, uh, this more quality attention, uh, what I call in the book proactive attention, two to three hours in the day. So what we need to do is defend that as if it's the most precious little thing in the world. Because as we know, uh, when you've got that really quality attention and you've got you know a really good plan in front of you, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna write this report, whatever, it's really easy for that quality attention to get scrambled and you end up in someone else's boring meeting or you end up in your email inbox and suddenly it's 11 o'clock and suddenly it's lunchtime and the thing isn't done. So, you know, defending that attention, we'll talk a bit more about some of the tactics around that a bit later, um, really important, but getting ruthless with that uh, will really, really help. And then the final one before I um, just throw this open for a little, um, little planning break is weapon savvy. So a productivity ninja needs to be weapon savvy. Um, so it's really important to think about how we use different apps, um, how we use different tools. And there's a couple of things I want to say about this. Um, the first is uh, the most important type of app to use, because often, you know, the, the first question I get when people find out what, what I do is like, oh, cool, what apps do I download? And it sort of misses the point because um, one, of our, one of our company values at Think Productive actually is psychology before technology. So thinking about our own habits, thinking about how we work, um, really stripping back the layers in terms of, you know, the processes of work um, for ourselves is much more important than getting a cool new tool. Um, in fact, the app that I use uh, to manage my to-do list, I've used, I think, three different apps in 15 years, right? So I tend to, once I'm using something, the, the trick is to get as much utility out of that as possible. Um, you find these people who are kind of constantly switching from one app to another, they're not getting much done, right? So if you want to um, figure out one kind of app that will really change your life, it would be to get what I call a second brain app. So I talk about this in the book, the ninja needs a second brain because the mind is for having ideas and not for holding them. You really want to free up your brain to be less about memory and much more about creativity. And what that means is putting all of the work that you're doing, um, putting all of that into uh, some kind of second brain that you're going to come back to. Um, Celine's just saying, yeah, my flow is not in the morning, but in the late afternoon. Yes, there are definitely people who are the other way around, right? So the, the whole biorhythms thing um, is real. The majority of people it's going to be in the morning, but not everybody. So um, the trick is with proactive attention is really working out um, when you have that best attention and just reflecting on that over a few days, sussing out your patterns, and you will find that there are rhythms around um, when you have that best energy. But yes, um, having everything in, in some kind of second brain, the one I use is called Todoist. Um, I was previously on, on one called Nosby, which is great. Uh, there's another one uh, called Toodle Do. These will all basically do the same thing is that they will allow you to put everything um, into this second brain and then you allow that to become your memory and it frees up the rest of your brain um, to be much more creative. Uh, the other thing that I really recommend is spending a bit of time um, dealing with email. So this uh, slide is uh, there to represent the, the mounds of email that we all get. Um, and I recommend a couple of things with email. One is keep your inbox at zero, which sounds um, crazy when you first encounter it. Um, but I'll guarantee you that uh, the, the chapter in my book, which is called Ninja Email, um, spend about an hour and a half, two hours with that chapter and your inbox will be at zero. And one of the ways to do that is cheating, right? So not cheating in a sense of control A and then delete, 
because there might well be things that you really need in there. But certainly being really intentional about anything that's older than a month, older than a month or so, move it to one side, get it out of the way. The whole point of email is really to get out of your inbox where all the good stuff really happens and spend as little time on everybody else's priorities as possible. Because what is the, what is your email inbox? It's a list of everybody else's priorities, not yours. So um, just to recap those first three then, so Zen Like Calm, the idea of getting everything out of your head, the idea of achieving this state of being present and in the moment and focused on your work um, by getting all of that stuff out of your head, all those different ideas and nags and distractions. Um, then we talked about ruthlessness, so being ruthless with ourselves around our procrastination, being ruthless in defending our attention, particularly that two to three hours where we have the best attention in the day, and then weapon savvy using tools, um, thinking about a tool for a second brain, thinking about email and inbox zero and um, our relationship with all of that technology. So um, I'm just going to give you a minute. Um, so just on your own, if you're watching this uh, with somebody else in the room watching it with you, feel free to um, chat amongst yourselves. If you're on your own, feel free to type things into the chat or just write down on a, on a pen and paper. What I'd love to know is what's the one thing from what I've just said that you think, oh, that reminds me, I need to do this new thing. So if there's something that you can do as a result of this, um, that maybe I've just uh, reminded you that, you know, you have some kind of uh, like intention to make something different. That's what I'd love you to write down. Um, and then by writing it down, you make that commitment a little bit more real. Um, so I'll just give you a minute to do that. If anyone would, would like to share that, uh, I'm not sure who that was speaking because I can't see you all, um, but yeah, feel free uh, or just type it in the chat. That would be great as well. And I'll maybe read a couple out, um, but I'd love you to just uh, make sure you've got something written down and something that you can actually do as a result of this. And we're going to do that a couple more times as we go through this session. Yes, Mark. Um, so you can keep me posted on your your um, route to Inbox Zero and I'll be happy to help. And my um, contact details, I'll share them uh, at the end as well. Um, we also run a workshop, by the way, called Getting Your Inbox to Zero for Teams around this stuff, um, very specifically. Three hours and everyone gets to zero by the end. When we did the numbers, it was 96% recently. So all good. Right, um, I'm going to move on because um, I've got, I want to make sure that there's time for me to just be a resource and answer questions um, and I've got six more characteristics to share with you. So I'm just gonna um, go through these pretty quick and then feel free to just hold your questions, put stuff in the chat and then um, we'll come back to those at the end. Um, so the next one is stealth and camouflage. Um, broadly speaking, this is about tactical hiding, right? So the thing about those first three characteristics is the idea of getting you know, in flow and being present and in the moment, people love the idea of that. Um, getting ruthless and managing your attention in a ruthless way, cool, uh, getting good tools, you know, inbox zero, getting a nice second brain app. Um, people are generally on board with those first three, um, you know, pretty quickly. But the thing is, then people say, well, the thing is I work in an open plan office or I'm, you know, sat where I'm on Slack all day and everyone's pinging me all the time and I can sit here with my to-do list, but I'm just being interrupted all the time. Uh, there was a study that found that a one minute email interruption takes you on average 15 minutes to get back onto the thing you're doing. So if you think about that, that whole thing of being in flow, if you break that flow, it's really hard because there's a kind of setup cost mentally uh, to being in the zone with the thing that you were working on. And um, so what it found was that the average time is 15 minutes. For some people, it took them all day and they still didn't get back onto the thing that they were doing. So these interruptions can be really, really costly. Um, and this is exactly the same digitally. So obviously, um, over the last year or so, people have been generally working from home. So I really recommend spending some time uh, looking at your relationship with interruptions, looking at your relationship with tech, and looking at what you allow to, to grab your attention or not. Uh, so a few things that I think can really help here. Um, what you can see on the screen there, that red button top right on the Microsoft Outlook thing there, it's called Work Offline. It's my favorite but button in Outlook. So what this button does is you press that button and work offline, and then you can reply to all the emails that, you're, that are in your inbox. You can look at your calendar. You can send new emails out. 
but guess what? All the new emails will not come in. So it just allows you that little bit of space where you're not hearing all those new, uh, you know, bits of information coming in. And by the way, if you have notifications turned on, on any of your email uh, platforms, just turn them off. I have to say like, so my book, Productivity Ninja, there's hundreds of things in there. And probably the one that comes back most often when people read it is they say, do you know what? I turned off all the notifications on uh, my email and it's changed my life. So even just that simple little thing can make a huge difference. Um, I recommend thinking about using airplane mode, do not disturb mode. Um, the, the, the slight kind of upgrade from that is using apps that block uh, stuff on your phone. Um, the one I use, I'm an Android person. So the one I use is called Quality Time. Uh, I think it's free or it might be like a couple of pounds. But basically the idea of Quality Time is you can block your access to things like Instagram, email, whatever at certain times of the day. So I know my proactive attention time, the time when I have my best energy is in the morning. So, you know, basically from, from 6 a.m. until 1 p.m., my blocker app just blocks my access to those things. To get access to Instagram, I have to go to the app and then it counts down from an hour, like 59, 59, 59, 58, and it will just do that until zero. So I'm not going to sit there and watch that for an hour and it just keeps me off those apps. So um, you, can, you can set that so it will allow you access to other things. So if you need access to WhatsApp for work or something, you can have that. You can also have it where it will allow you access to WhatsApp, but it won't ping and notify you of stuff, which I also find really helpful. Like the things just don't come up on the screen, um, but I can still get in there and send stuff if I need to. Um, so that's a really useful one. If you're an iPhone person, I'd recommend Freedom um, or Off Time is another good one, um, but really nice apps. The great, one, great thing with Freedom is it works cross-platform as well. So you can have it on your laptop and everywhere else. You know, restricting your use of the internet, I'd really recommend... Um, particularly if you feel like you're someone who's easily distracted, um, if there's a lot of things that you might uh, sort of run off down the rabbit warrens to look at and things like that. Um, and then the last one there, Forest, this is a lovely little app. So the idea of this is that you, uh, if you want to work on your laptop and you don't want to be distracted by your phone, you set Forest up on your phone and you pick a time period. So let's say I'm going to work for half an hour. Forest on the screen will grow a little tree. And if during that half an hour you pick up your phone and you turn off Forest to turn off Instagram or whatever, the tree dies. So it's just a really simple piece of little um, positive psychology there that says there's one good reason to not check my phone. Um, Forest actually, um, the, the makers of that app, they plant real trees in the real world. Um, so your procrastination costs trees. You can have genuine climate guilt uh, through your procrastination. So definitely worth checking out. A um, couple more, and then I'm going to open up, um, again, the, the discussion and a little bit of planning. Um, so this is unorthodoxy. Um, so the idea of taking inspiration from really unusual places, learning from extremes, um, not being afraid to be different, and not being afraid to not follow the rule book. So I think taking inspiration from unusual sources um, is, a, is, is just really a competitive advantage in business. Um, I work with a whole range of different uh, corporate clients from a whole range of different in industries. So a couple of really big automotive industry clients, a couple of really big banking clients. We work with some of the leading tech companies. And what I find is in every single one of those places, people tend to follow their most direct competitors and follow the lead there. It's like, oh, so-and-so is doing this, so we should do that too. So-and-so is doing this, so we need to respond to that. But what we don't see very often is people just taking inspiration from completely unusual um, places. And I find sometimes that's really the, the best way to, to get creativity happening isn't always to come up with a new idea, it's to, to combine two existing ones, right? So just finding ideas from different places um, makes a huge difference. So if you're trying to solve a problem, or you're trying to communicate something, think what would someone in a really values-based role do? Like what would Malala do about this, right? Like very values-based, very clear on what she stands for, very clear on her values. Um, so that can really drive your decisions and whatever your company values are um, can really drive um, the right kind of decisions. If you're trying to solve a problem, think about how would I explain this to a curious, intelligent six-year-old? Really good litmus test. If you can't explain your idea really simply, then your idea is probably too complicated. So if you can't explain it to a curious, intelligent six-year-old, then think again about how you define it and what you're really trying to say. Um, think about Hollywood and EasyJet. So what would I do with this if I had a huge budget, a Hollywood budget? 
what would I do if I, if I had a budget, airline budget, if I had almost no money, what would I do here? Um, and if you think about Airbnb, really good example of a company taking inspiration from unusual places. So they noticed this whole platform economy that was happening. And if they'd have tried to just be the next Marriott, they'd probably have a lot of very empty buildings right now, but they've become the big, biggest hotel, hotel chain in the world and they don't own a single hotel. So really kind of um, different uh, places to look at there. But I think sometimes when we're stuck, it's a really useful little exercise is just try and take inspiration from really unusual sources. Um, and good things happen when, when we do that. Other thing about unorthodoxy, I'm a big believer that um, we spend a lot of time um, not really thinking about how to maximize or optimize our own habits. Um, and I, a few years ago, I did this thing where it was um, for a year, I did a year of extreme productivity experiments. So the idea was every month I would um, take on some stupid extreme challenge and then basically see what I learned from it. And I actually, even though the things I was doing were pretty extreme, I learned some great stuff. So I did a, a month of uh, flipping the nine to five. So instead of working nine till five, I worked five till 9 a.m. Clocking off at 9 a.m. That was pretty weird. Um, and I also did um, uh, five till 9 p.m. So having the whole day free and then doing my work in the evening. Uh, and what it turned out was, even though I was the productivity guy, it turned out that when I only had four hours in a day, just that extra level of scarcity made me so much more conscious and defending my attention in an even more ruthless way than before. And I found that actually I got nearly as much done in, in four hours as I would in a normal day. So really we think that we're jam packed with stuff, but you know, it's that, that thing where you think you have a really full week and then something happens where let's say your kids are off school and suddenly you've only got two days. Well, you still manage to get a lot done in the two days and you shift things around and a few things can be canceled that weren't going to be canceled before and all that sort of stuff. So I think playing around with constraint is a really interesting thing. And I also did one which was um, work an hour a day, but seven days a week. Turned out that wasn't enough. Um, and I was just really stressed the whole month. But it's really interesting to, um, to play with some of these extremities. Um, I did a month where whenever I was stuck with something at work, I would make the decision just by the throw of dice. So it would just allow me this um, this sort of moment, this possibility of saying, right, how do I choose between two different options or three different options or six different options? Then I roll the dice and then I make the decision on what to do based on that. Um, something really interesting happened as part of that month, which, which was that when you're making decisions by dice, they're kind of not your decisions. Uh, and, and, I, and I genuinely did stick to the decisions that I made. And so detaching the ego from decision-making was such a big piece of learning that I just wouldn't have got otherwise. And so, um, so now, you know, just being aware that so much of what we invest emotionally in decisions is ego, right? It's like, am I going to be judged for this? And, you know, is this my pet idea? And once you don't care who takes the credit, it's amazing how many amazing uh, things can happen in, in a workplace, right? Um, so detaching the ego from decision-making, uh, both in terms of fear, in terms of credit, uh, made a big difference. I also did a month where I ate the optimum diet for productivity and uh, then fasted for Ramadan and just observed how that affected my productivity, how it affected my moods um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And the point with this is not to say you should do the same, but the point is to say that when you experiment with um, the sort of standard ways of working, you really notice uh, a lot more about how you're managing yourself and how you're managing your attention and what your relationship is to stuff like email or to creative work or whatever. Um, so what I'd um, really invite you to do is think about what kind of ruts you might be stuck in yourself. So um, do you start every day by cranking up the laptop and starting with email? Um, do you, are you taking naps or not, David, right? And um, are you starting your day by, uh, you know, going for a run around the park or are you starting your day just with a cup of tea? Like, and however you are normally in that pattern, just reverse it or change it, switch it up just for a couple of days. Um, and you'll really notice some interesting stuff by doing that. Um, in the times when you're traveling to offices, um, just drive a different route to the office or, or you know, uh, change on the, on the underground, you know, in a different way to get to the same destination or get off one stop earlier. And you will find just the tiny, tiny changes get you out of that kind of stuck in the rut uh, kind of status quo mode and get you much more into a creative mode of what do I want? What do I need? And like, how am I going to set my day up in order to achieve that? So just a really nice way of thinking about habits and 
um, personal experiments. And make this stuff a game. I think the reason that um, the getting your inbox to zero um, workshop really works and the, and the reason the idea of inbox zero really works is, is ultimately because it's like gamification, right? It's like emails are a really boring thing, but getting it like back to zero and then being like, yes, I can go home for the day and it's at zero, that becomes the game. So anything in, in work that feels dull, that feels boring, that you can turn into a game, um, that's going to really help. Uh, one more on agility, and then I'm going to open it back up um, to you all to um, uh, do some planning. So agility. So this feels like a very relevant little section for um, the last few months. But what happens when um, stuff hits the fan, when we have to fight fires? Um, one thing that's really important to say here is it's much easier to drop everything and go and deal with the emergency if you know what everything looks like. So having everything um, in a second brain, having a really good projects list as well as your actions list, knowing what those projects relate to, it's much easier to be able to drop everything. And also it's much easier to recover after you've you've dealt with the fire, you've dealt with the emergency, you're back in the day-to-day -day kind of mode. Um, it's much easier to pick that stuff up if it's all really comprehensively written down, you've got good clarity around it, good organization around it. We talk in a few minutes about preparedness as well. Um, but it's, it's a really important thing. And I think once you start to have good clarity and good systems around this stuff, a good second brain around this stuff, I mean, it really helps you to be more strategic because you know um, what's there. So when you think about this, often when we feel like there's a crisis looming, we're more likely to be focused on small details, tiny things. But actually, for some reason, having all that, that uh, data and detail around our work, having a really good second brain, allows us much more to sit back and reflect, to be more expansive um, and actually, you know, open up to the possibility of those bigger strategic decisions. Um, so really important in terms of if you want to be more proactive in your thinking, a really good place to start is getting more, more organized in your day to day. Um, so you get more proactive in your thinking when you get more organized in the day to day. And the final thing about um, agility, just a really quick thing, stop trying to multitask. So multitasking does not work. Um, and all the science points to this is you basically, because there's a setup cost with everything that you do, you can't do two things at the same time. It's just a, it's just a slower way, a, a suboptimal way of working. So instead, what we need to think about is monotasking. So working on one thing up to its completion point, moving on to the next thing. And the same happens with, um, you know, how we set up our desks, how we set up our screens. Don't have 15 different windows open. Don't have 20 things on the desk that all relate to other stuff only have in front of you what relates to the thing that you're working on at that moment, you know, right now. And what you find is just by eliminating the clutter of that, you have more focus to put onto the thing, thing that you're trying to do. So um, three uh, more habits that we talked about, stealth and camouflage, the idea of uh, being deliberately less available, thinking about how we deal with notifications, thinking about how we deal with the stuff that has our attention. Um, unorthodoxy, so experimenting with our own habits and taking inspiration from unusual places. And then agility, so the, the ability to be able to react, to firefight, to deal with crises and then come back, um, hopefully unscathed. So just give you another minute. If you want to type anything in the chat, I'd love you to just be thinking about what's the thing that as you were just listening to me there, you thought, oh, that reminds me, I should try this. So I'm going to do that. Or this is the thing that might help me in the next few days. Um, so just make a little note somewhere on a, a piece of paper in front of you, on your phone, wherever it needs to be, in your diary, um, just an intention for you to do, an action for you to take. Just give you a moment to do that. Okay, and we've got three more. So I'm going to move real quick because I want to make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A as well. So this is mindfulness. Um, so often we think about uh, meditation in its more traditional uh, kind of form. I think there's lots of ways that we can uh, tune more into uh, the thoughts that our brain is having. Often our brain is thinking about stuff that we don't even realize. So getting into that subconscious, noticing our thoughts, noticing the patterns, really, really important, particularly around procrastination, as I'll come to in a minute. Um, so if you're not into the idea of meditation, I think there's loads of other ways to just get your brain into a different mode and start to notice those thoughts a bit more. Um, so I'll leave that there as a little way to get you to just think about what's the thing that allows you to just step out of work mode and into a different way of thinking, a different kind of flow. 
And this is really important around procrastination because what happens um, when I'm doing meditation and yoga and actually this is the same when I'm cooking, it's the same when I'm walking, is you're noticing a part of the brain called, called the lizard brain, the amygdala. It's the bit of the brain that's right at the back. It's the bit that gives us fight or flight. Uh, the lizard brain is concerned with all of our basic survivalistic functions. So um, it's food, it's reproduction, it's territory, jealousy, you know, really strong emotions that shout very loud. And this is really critical when it comes uh, to work and procrastination. And the reason for this is if you think about that, uh, that setting where you're on a Zoom call or in, you're in a meeting and everyone goes around the table and everyone has to say their name and what they're working on or something. And it gets to the person right before you. And in your brain, you're thinking, well, I know my name's Graham, but like, don't screw this up, right? In your brain, you're kind of having this little moment of panic. That's your lizard brain. And that's your lizard brain basically saying, I don't want to stand out. I want to blend in. I want to be part of the tribe. I want to be accepted by the tribe. I don't want to stand out. So when we think about that, we also need to think about all those things where we're about to deliver a piece of work. We're about to send the report. We're about to make something happen. And we know that we're going to be judged in that moment, um, you know, as, as that thing gets uh, consumed by other people. When people start to see the report, when they start to see the results, they're going to they're going to judge us based on that. So all of that really fires up the lizard brain. And it's really important to recognize that that can be such a big source of procrastination. Um, when I first released How to Be a Productivity Ninja, quite ironically, a week or so before the book came out, um, I spent one whole evening looking at every single one-star Amazon review that I could find of any other book just on Amazon. It's like, why am I doing that? And it's part of my lizard brain saying, don't put this book out into the world, hold it back, um, you know, don't do anything that's going to stand out or be judged. Um, and that way you'll be less offensive, you'll be part of the tribe you know, you'll be accepted. But guess what? Most of the things that we do that really matter involve us putting ourselves out there and being judged and goes totally against our survivalistic, survivalistic instincts. But it's really important to um, think about that in terms of procrastination. So procrastination often is the fear. It's the fear of standing out from the crowd. And so we tend to want to hold on to the things uh, or not even start the things that we're going to get judged by when you know really what we want to do is is push against that lizard brain idea um seth godin has a lovely thing where he says um he uses the the lizard brain as his compass so it's like once he knows that there's that fear in his brain of like oh, this thing is going to get judged then for him it's like now i'm onto something this is what i need to do um so really important to notice those thoughts mindfulness really helps you to do that um also mindfulness is a really important tool to recognize how far we've come right so sometimes it can feel uh, in the day to day like we're really lost but we've got to really recognize uh, how far it is we've actually come already so that's a really important little um thing with mindfulness uh here's a little tip is at the end of the week um, as well as writing your to-do list for the following week write your have done list or your tada list because uh, just that little moment of mindfulness as you do that will actually set you up for the week ahead um, it releases a chemical in the brain called dopamine which is highly addictive and it means that the next week it's like i want more of that like let's more let's make more things happen um two to finish i'm just going to really um quickly rush through these so um preparedness the idea of being really organized didn't really come naturally to me at all um it's not my kind of naturally organized state but what i've realized is that being organized is a way of giving your future self a gift so knowing that when i'm going to be in um, real uh, periods of busyness, knowing that I set myself up really well, um, is going to really help me. And the main thing I would say to you about um, being prepared um, is to think about doing some kind of regular weekly checklist or weekly review. And um, so David Allen in Getting Things Done talks about the weekly review. There's a whole chapter on it in How, in How to Be a Productivity Ninja as well. Um, and basically, and also if you um, Google think productive weekly checklist we've got like a pdf that you can download as a, like a little starting point but basically it's a couple of hours every week where you're going to get everything organized you're going to do some good quality thinking around your lists you're going to really do that that strategic thinking about uh, around what's next um, and then just get set for the next um, next week or next couple of weeks and sleep is really important that's what that slide is there to say um, and then final one and then it's we're going to open up to some q a um so I, um, I very passionately believe that a productivity ninja is a human and not a superhero. So there are no special powers. There is no secret source. 
And so really, the if there was, the secret source of productivity would be do the simple things consistently and well. That's it, right? So there's no, there's, there's no special apps that will make you brilliant at this. Um, it's all about your own psychology and your own habits. But it's also, also about saying we have limitations, right? So would you want an operation from this guy? And we need to think about our limits. We need to make sure that we're not um, biting off more than we can chew. And we need to be realistic that as humans, um, we need to make sure we're taking the right levels of rest and giving ourselves um, the gifts that we need, right? So refreshing our mojo, finding out what really makes us tick. There's so many things that make me tick that I can't do right now. I'm going to watch football, uh, music gigs, huge part of my life usually. So I'm kind of missing those other ways to refresh my mojo. Um, so just finding the things for right now, for me, it's like, doing more walks and being in nature more is the thing that's kind of making up for that. But yeah, I really miss the music. Um, so those are our nine characteristics. Um, and I'm just going to give you a couple of other things to take away in ways that you can connect with me um, as well before we finish. So this is the point now where I'd love you to just be thinking about um, questions that you'd like to ask. We've got about 15 minutes. Um, and um, if you want to ask questions in the chat, feel free to do that as well. I'll just scroll through in a second and just have a look if there's any other questions in the chat too um, but yeah just before we get to that um so those are my contact details on there i think pam's going to put this in the the chat as well so um, if you want to connect with me on instagram and stuff like that it's just at graham alcott and if you go to graham forward slash links um, you can find different ways to connect with me so like my my new books on there uh, my sunday emails on there lots of other stuff like that um and those are the books which you can get on amazon and everywhere else um and then um so a couple of other things just to share every sunday i do this uh email called rev up for the week so the idea is one uh one productive or positive idea for the week ahead so if you want to sign up to that if you just go to graymalcott.com um you can sign up for rev up for the week so i write it um just a few days before um so often i'm kind of reacting to what's going on in the news and things that are going on but gen just generally sharing one idea which i think can really help um, to, to really boost your week for the week ahead. So that comes out every Sunday evening. Um, I've got a new book coming out later on this year called How to Fix Meetings. Uh, it's available for, for pre-order on Amazon. That's also on my graymalcott.com forward slash links uh, thing that I mentioned a minute ago. So you can uh, find How to Fix Meetings on there. Uh, my podcast is called Beyond Busy. So I interview interesting people about the big questions to do with work. Um, I just had Seth Godin on last week, uh, which was just really exciting. I've got Cal Newport, the author of um, Deep Work, uh, coming up in a few weeks as well. And so subscribe to Beyond Busy. And my company is Think Productive. So we do a whole range of workshops. We've got offices around the world and we can help your team around some of these productivity issues. So if that's of interest, it's thinkproductive.com. And then I'll leave that one on the screen. So um, let's get in some, into some questions. Uh, I think there's a couple that I'm just going to scroll back a little bit. So this is from uh, Louis. I currently block off 30 minutes at the end of every work day to clear the inbox. I make a point of flagging or ticking off emails. Yes. Uh, so this is the thing is so much of what we have to do day to day, you know, the conversations with our team members, um, you know, clearing our email, we don't put it on our calendar. And then we have back to back meetings on, on other stuff. And then we realize why uh, there's, there's stuff that gets neglected, right? So I have three times a week on my calendar, I have email processing like written into the calendar and I try and stick to the main, my main organization with it is, um, is, is done on those three times a week, basically. Uh, Charles is saying, I heard Freedom app and Forest app. Was there a third? Yes. Yeah, so uh, Freedom's a really good, um, it's iPhone and Android. Um, it works across platform to block different apps. The one I use on my phone is called Quality Time. Um, so that's just an Android only app. There's an iPhone equivalent called Off Time, which is an, an, an iPhone only phone blocker app. Um, there's actually a few other apps uh, coming out right now just on the same kind of topic as well. Um, and Forest is really good. Maybe more advice about how to get rid of the lizard brain state. Yes, um, this could be like a whole hour in itself, but let me give you two or three ways to deal with the lizard brain. Um, so there's another, there's another book, which is called The Chimp Paradox, 
which takes the lizard brain idea and says and just calls it chimp it's the same kind of thing um, and that's a really great book so one of the things in that book is um, Steve Peters he talks about the idea of taking your chimp for a walk so the idea is those um, those very survivalistic panicky thoughts that we have that often lead to procrastination because um, you know once we start to have those thoughts and entertain those thoughts it's like the consequence is too big to actually do the work so we stop doing the work if you ever think back to you know school and university and stuff and um, if you think about the what what were you doing three days before the essay was due it was like you were tidying your bedroom right and then in the last few hours it's like suddenly you know and why do we why does that state change it's because suddenly we have a bigger fear which is missing the deadline right so that takes over from the lizard brain um, and you know the lizard brain just has something bigger to worry about um, so exercising that chimp so what that means in practice is just writing down all your fears you know the more you exercise those fears the more you look at them you think ah my logical brain can actually override that now and i start to see how how silly those things are um, another tip is um put a deadline in someone else's world so uh, then you don't want to miss the deadline so uh, if you are really worried about doing this report and you think oh my you know i don't really want to be doing this report because i'm worried about what it's going to say i'm really worried that i'm going to look silly whatever the thought process is if you say to your boss hey can we on monday morning at 11 a.m can we go through my report and i'll have it in the room ready for us to do that then you have a you know you have a, a, a closer deadline where it's like now i have to have something to show now my bigger fear is i don't want to look silly in front of my boss so i better get it done so those kind of deadlines that I th I'm not a believer in false deadlines. I think you need something real so that your brain actually knows that it's real, but putting deadlines in other people's worlds are really good um, for overcoming lizard brain. Um, and then the final one I'll say about lizard brain is um, there's a book uh, called the artist's way by Julia Cameron, which is, which is actually a book about creativity. Um, but she has this technique in there, which is basically it's called the morning pages. You basically write three pages of a four, just first thing in the morning, just write freehand, you know, three pages. And what you find is it just gets all the gunk out of your, out of your head. So you have all those lizard brain thoughts on the paper. You see how ridiculous they are. And also you can take action, right? It's just like, oh, turns out I'm scared about that conversation I've got to have with Joe later. And so then you have some, some data, you've got something to deal with. And that can be like, okay, so now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put this in Joe's diary. So I know it's definitely going to happen or, I'm really worried about it why don't i just do it first so i'm not carrying it around all day so yeah there's lots you can say about procrastination and the lizard brain um and so i'll leave it at those three little tips uh sandra says my problem is that i'm never done i'm very productive but when i finished i will have many other things to pick up how do you benefit from uh being productive and fast yeah so this is the thing sometimes what happens is people say well I'm the most productive person in my team. And the consequence of that is everybody else gives me work to do. So I would say this is a different question if you're an entrepreneur, as it would be is if you're working in a team where there's essentially, you know, there's in some ways, there's no incentive to be the most productive person on your team if you're all getting paid the same. And um, what I would say is the way to benefit from being productive and fast is it's not a bad career choice, right? So if you can start to be, seen as being the person in your, in your team that makes things happen um usually you won't be on the same pay as those other people for that long um you know you'll be moving up uh, and and doing things in a different way um, but i would say the other thing if you're an entrepreneur if you have autonomy over your time um the way to benefit from being productive and fast is to view productivity in a slightly bigger sense so i think when i'm going for a walk um in the woods just up um over the hill from me here I view that as a productive walk, right? And so I'm in as intentional about wanting to do that, wanting to experience that, wanting to enjoy that as I am about my work. So I take it kind of as seriously. And what that means is I'm not going to compromise that to do more and more work in the evening. So I think really the way I sort of view that is I benefit from being productive and fast by, you know, being able to do the things that I really want to do, but also have lots of free time, leisure time, and so on. So my company works a four day week. Um, I'm very bounded around um, not working at weekends. So even though my, my weekly email comes out on a Sunday, I don't write it on the Sunday. Um, but just having those kind of boundaries in place, I think is another way to, uh, to benefit from that. Relationships and productivity, any advice on when you and 
yeah, uh, when you are a morning person, your partner is an evening person, and you're both super proactive ships passing in the night. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm being asked to give you relationship advice. Um, I don't know about that. I would say the thing with that is um, I, I think for me, it's about how you uh, how you kind of down tools versus not. Right. So like finding the time where you don't necessarily either of you need to have proactive attention um, to be able to really give your attention fully to each other. Um, so I think that's a slightly different thing. So I would say creating the spaces um, where you can actually just enjoy each other's attention and enjoy each other's company. Um, that would be the important thing with that one. But yeah, uh, it's a curveball being asked about relationship advice. Um, I've heard a lot. Uh, this is Fabian. Uh, I've heard a lot that meditation can help with productivity because it clears your mind in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I didn't share because I was running out of time is um, I, I really knew nothing about meditation when I wrote this book. But I wrote the book, uh, True Ninja Stealth and Camouflage Style in a Beach Hut in Sri Lanka. And the only person that I uh, really spoke to in the month that I was in Sri Lanka writing was a Buddhist monk who I just happened to meet at the bus stop one day and then we got on the same bus. And so he invited me to, to his monastery and I learned meditation from him. And I just found it hugely powerful um, in terms of productivity. So it went in the book and it became one of the characteristics and that was how that happened. Um, hi, Graham. How did you set away time for writing your books while running a business? Yeah, that, that's what I just explained. That's a funny uh, coincidence. So, um, yeah, I was running a business and it was I was really struggling to make time um, to write the first book. And so what I did was basically just booked plane tickets and just said to everyone, right, I'm going to be away. I'm going to be offline. Um, I was in a place with no Wi-Fi. Um, this is going back to 2012. Um, and the ultimate stealth and camouflage maneuver, right? Like making myself deliberately less available. Um, how I do it now, because I'm just currently writing book six, um, is um, I tend to view my morning time as my writing time. When I'm really in flow with it, I'm up early as well. It's kind of like six till 9 a.m. is my kind of real pure writing time. But if you look at my calendar, uh, most days there's a big purple block in my calendar which runs from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. And it just says create in, big, create in big letters. And then in the afternoon, there's nothing in my diary, but what that means is collaborate. So for me, it's like create time is the morning. That's my best attention. And that's when I write. And then the afternoon is collaboration with everyone else, helping everyone else solve issues and stuff like that. So I kind of view it as a kind of two-way thing. Now, two parts of the day. And I, by the way, so this is the thing is like, uh, sometimes I explain that and people say, yeah, but I have meetings all, all day. Um, your create time doesn't have to be half the day. It could be an hour a day. It could be half an hour a day. Um, but just being intentional to say, that's a thing that I'm not going to book over. And I'm really, really protective over that um, create time in the morning. Ever use a tomato timer? Yes. So that comes from the Pomodoro technique, David, which is a great thing that you can just Google. Basically, it's 25 minutes of really focused attention, five minutes procrastination, do whatever you like, um, 25 minutes work, five minutes off, and you just keep doing that. Um, and you can get apps as well. So you can use a, a traditional tomato timer, but you can also get apps that have the timer on and will just count down from 25 minutes. Really nice way of managing your attention. Um, I don't use it day to day, but when I'm doing like a full book kind of day where I'm writing, um, I find that breaking my attention after 25 minutes and then going back to it, gives me more energy th for the whole day because you're kind of having these, it just forces you to have regular breaks really. Um, and you're breaking your attention before you get um, too tired as well. Uh, Valerie says, during COVID time runs together, even though I know I should establish better boundaries. Oh, I've lost that question. Sorry, Valerie, where's it gone? Uh, during COVID time runs together, even though I know I should establish better boundaries, it's hard to implement or discipline myself to any suggestions um yeah um so if you're working from home you can still walk to work so just walk around the block around the corner um the brain works on um transitions right so there's a thing called enclosed cognition as well which is a real thing so basically um they they did lots of tests on um giving people maths problems to solve and if people were wearing a scientific white lab coat they felt more intelligent and got more more of the answers right they told another group that that same white lab coat was for an artist and those people got, you know, lower scores. And then the scores in the middle were the people who weren't wearing a lab coat at all. So in clothed cognition, like if you actually 
put on the clothes that feel like work and like really spend time, you know, having a shower and getting ready and all that stuff, then your brain automatically transitions into work mode. And that's, you know, it's a really powerful thing that all those kind of signifiers that we have in the brain, but yeah, going for a walk around the blocks, a good one. Um, and I think just making sure you take those regular breaks, um, particularly lunch. Um, I've just had this book um, come out a little while ago called how to have the energy, uh, which I wrote with um, a nutritionist called Colette Hennigan. One of the things that it says in this book is um, you actually get more nutritional value from your food if you're eating in a straight in in a state of less stress. So if you're sat there really relaxed and you're able to really digest your food, you'll get more nutritional value than if you're like eating al desco and at your desk and it and it and it feels really you know stressful. You just won't get the same nutritional value. Um, so lunch is really really important. It's the thing that everybody gets wrong. Um, you know, just in normal day to day life, people neglect lunch and, um, lunch is not for wimps. That's really the, um, the point of that. Uh, I think there's one more question. So I'm going to ask, answer that. And then we'll finish. How do you get people to respect your productivity hours without interrupting your state of flow when working from home? Um, so I, I'm a big believer that, um, the best way to think about this is how you manage your shared calendar. And then how you manage um, things like your kind of Slack status of being online or offline and everything else. Um, and one little tip is if you uh, find that you put in your diary thinking time or create time or whatever, and then everyone else disrespects it, what you should do is change that from thinking time to something really um, opaque that no one understands, like Project Magenta. And then everyone doesn't know what Project Magenta is, so they just leave you alone. Um, but using um, your calendar to, to be really intentional around that, I think is a great starting point. And also have conversations in your team as well. Like we talk about this all the time. Uh, we do this for a living, so we kind of have to, but um, in Think Productive, we talk a lot about different people's attention when different people are at their best. And, you know, it's a what goes around comes around kind of thing, right? Like it's really important to, to respect other people's attention, to try and inter interrupt people as little as possible. Um, to get out of the way and let them work, but also to allow them to do the same for you back. So just have those conversations within your team as well. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, my uh, Instagram is on there and you can check out graymalcott.com forward slash links and sign up to my, my weekly rev up for the week email from there. Uh, the podcast is beyond busy and uh, the books are all on there. Um, How to be a productivity ninja probably being the best known one. But it's been a pleasure. I loved your questions as well. So um, thanks everybody for um, tuning into this. Uh, do drop me a line and let me know how Inbox Zero goes and how everything else goes. And uh, yeah, real pleasure to hang out with you all this evening. So thank you, wherever you are in the world. <laughs>